Hello, Penguin Lords! So I'm the Baby Penguin, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Endurance! Last episode, we sent off Morningstar to Reaper, and now we can focus on finishing Artemis. However, before we can actually afford to send up the final completing module of Artemis and hire on a few more engineers to actually get the base fully operational and producing rockets on the surface of Nemesis, we need some more money. Yeah, building Morningstar was not cheap. It cost about five million funds. Uh, that was pretty much all of our money. So we just about have enough funds left to launch this and you'll probably notice it looks kind of like the Leto, our last sort of vehicle that travels to Artemis, collects cargo, etc. But it has been heavily redesigned. Using the new landing gear that we got from the Kerbal Reusability expansion, we can actually make a much better looking spacecraft than the Leto. This is the Asteria. Asteria was the sister of Leto, who is of course the mother of Apollo and Artemis. So it's still related. I thought it was different enough to uh, warrant a different name though. So if you don't know, if you haven't watched previous episodes, this is sort of our analogy to SpaceX's Starship system. So we've got one massive reusable booster and then a single Starship segment which heads off um, and heads out to Nemesis. Now it does rely on being refueled. It can't travel all the way to Nemesis and back um, with the fuel that it has. So it does require actual infrastructure to be in place in order for this to work. But with the infrastructure now in place, with Artemis now operating and producing fuel on the surface of Nemesis, this is the most cost effective way to transport transport people and cargo to and from the surface. So as you see it's been uh, yeah pretty radically redesigned. The biggest liberating thing was that the Leto had to be large enough to accommodate the rover uh, which we sent to Artemis and that was pretty huge and now we don't need to uh, carry that anymore and we're only carrying much smaller payloads. We can actually shrink the cargo bay uh, by about a half. So it's much more compact. I think it looks a lot better as well. We <laughs> also meant we could get away with a little less fuel and we could use some more powerful engines as well because those aerospikes, uh, they weren't great to be fair. Um, we only used them because they were compact enough that our landing gear could actually, you know, land us on the surface because we didn't have big landing gear. But now we do, we can use some slightly larger engines uh, in the form of those twin nozzle, uh, highly efficient and high thrust uh, engines based off of the RD... Ah, oh, I've forgotten the name. Ah, it'll come to me. That Russian, everywhere, anyone knows it. Well, anyone who knows rockets well knows it. The, uh, the really, really good Russian engine that's uh, essentially been unchanged for almost 60 years because it's just so freaking good. Uh, but yeah, that's essentially what these engines are modeled off of. And we're just using two of those. You'll see now that uh, yeah, it just looks so much better, doesn't it? <laughs> the last one, since we had to land on those tiny little landing legs, it really restricted what we could do with the spacecraft uh, since the landing legs couldn't actually reach past the heat shield uh, which was very unfortunate and it had to sort of balance on them and it was really unstable when it landed yeah it looks a damn sight better now I think it actually looks really good I spent a long time on it and I'm really happy with how it turned out uh, we did have to as you can see clip the engine sort of in but I think with just the nozzles sticking out from the uh, fuel tanks I think it looks pretty good uh, yeah I was pretty happy with it so what are we actually sending to Artemis Beardy? You said that there's something in the cargo bay. Well, yes. So what we're essentially going to do with this system is we're always going to be taking something to Artemis, whether it be supplies, machinery, because Artemis isn't fully self-sustaining. We're going to send up an agriculture module uh, that's going to be tacked on to the uh, other parts that we need. So we're going to sort of have an all-in-one module to finish off the base. And that will certainly reduce our supply consumption, but uh, it's not going to be 100% self-sufficient because that's a real pain to do. It will require a bunch more production chains in order to produce machinery and stuff that we're using and we use such small amounts of it uh, that really it's so much easier and cheaper as well just to resupply it now and then so we're going to be resupplying the base with um, life support and machinery but that's not what is actually in the spacecraft this time if you recall our silicon production plant isn't quite operating at peak efficiency it needs some more isrus to convert more spodamine into silicon because when you have an engineer on board you refine at a much higher rate and so I thought that uh, <laughs> our single ISRU would be uh, producing at 100% 
But since it's uh, it's an automated station, it's actually only producing 20% of the silicon that we need. So in our little cargo bay here, we have a module with a number of ISRUs and also a number of radiators because we didn't quite uh, have the capability to get rid of enough heat from uh, the previous ISRU. So it wasn't even operating at 20%. It was uh, <laughs> something like 90% of that because the, uh, the thermal problems we're having with it over overheating and the like. So we're going to be delivering that to the silicon production plant. However, the uh, Asteria doesn't quite have enough fuel to land there, deploy it, and then go all the way to Artemis as well. So what we're doing is we're landing, refueling at Artemis, picking up an engineer, because we don't actually have any engineers. They're all on Artemis or on Morningstar, and we don't have the funds to hire another one just yet. And so we're going to pick up an engineer from Artemis, refuel the Asteria, go over to the silicon production plant, fix that, head back, grab a whole load of rare metals and exotic minerals and ship that back to solitude for profit. So as you see here, we get a pretty beautiful shot. Uh, with these new landing gear, it really does look awesome. I think it it looks like a proper spacecraft, not some janky mess that you've actually thrown together in Kerbal Space Program like the Leto did. I, I, I can't stop expressing just quite how happy I am with how this thing looks. Look at that! And it's actually stable as well, which means we can uh, swap away and come back without the uh, spacecraft jumping 50 feet into the air and falling on its side, which was a slight problem with the Leto. So what we're doing here is we're just getting Ben Kerman out. He's the uh, head of operations here on Artemis. And he is just grabbing a pipe endpoint and he's got a drill. And we need to take him over to the silicon production plant because we're going to deploy this new module with the extra ISRUs and radiators and we're going to need to connect them up. But first we need to actually connect up the uh, Asteria to Artemis so that we can refuel it. Because we have that uh, fuel plant over there manufacturing fuel from the ore that we're mining on site. Unfortunately, uh, the Asteria is landed a little bit too far away. So what we're going to have to do is move it a little bit closer. Now, I wasn't 100% uh, <laughs> comfortable with uh, with controlling this thing yet. I hadn't quite got the hang of it. Uh, so you see here, I was coming down and I thought, oh, no, we're going to hit the radiators. Okay, let's not do that. And then I tried to abort and then overcompensated. And then we ended up uh, traveling even further away. Uh, <laughs> so we had to sort of uh, move about a little bit. But it turns out that we were just about close enough that if we moved the pipe endpoint on Artemis to uh, the other side of that airlock there, we could just about reach it. So that's what we did. We just got another one, put it down, and then what we can do is we can just about reach it and we can start refueling it. So yeah, there's uh, there's so much fuel on Artemis that um, I'm really happy with this sort of system. It's not the most efficient way of doing things. A lot of people suggested um, something similar to what they actually do in the Artemis novel, where you have something in orbit, like a big, it's called a meat ship, I think, but it's something powered by nuclear propulsion, and you just send crew and cargo up to that, then that uses extremely efficient engines and stuff to transport uh, all of that to the moon, and then you have another lander there, um, or that then uses different engines to land. So you've got something dedicated to space and something just dedicated to launching. Um, and although that would have been, yes, more efficient, uh, I'd much rather do it this way. It's much less time consuming. We only have to, we just go straight to the base and then we only have to refuel it once. We don't have to do a bunch of rendezvousing in orbit and use a number of different spacecraft. It's one spacecraft does everything. Um, it sort of simplifies all our logistics, which I think is really the key to this sort of thing. You know, simplifying the amount of vehicles we need uh, and shortening the amount of time it takes to do these missions. Because if we're going to have this be sustainable, then that's what it's going to need to be. You know, it's a similar idea with SpaceX's Starship. It's a one vehicle does everything sort of uh, sort of deal. Uh, it's the most cost effective, simple way of doing things. Just simplify your logistics so that one vehicle can do it all. Um, even if it can't do it quite as well as you know having a number of different optimized vehicles, it just you know it's much easier on your R and D and everything. And it saves me a lot of time to just have this one vehicle that can do it all. And it's not like we've got any shortage of fuel on Artemis. As I said, it's producing fuel continuously uh, far more than we're ever going to be using and if it ever fills up its fuel tanks it just dumps the excess fuel into our planetary stockpile so yeah uh, <laughs> it's not going to be a problem you will have noticed that um, Artemis I keep trying to hide it with the editing but Artemis does jump up into the air every time uh, we load it it jumps about 10 meters into the air that's just um, a very irritating glitch um, where it just for some reason 
puts itself about 10 meters above the ground um, but due to the ground tether function of USI it's sort of frozen there so then I have to gently let it down uh, I am trying to sort of hide it with the editing but you will have noticed it uh, here and there hopefully when we update this save file to 1.7 that will be fixed and yeah you heard that right um, we are actually going to be updating at the moment we're in 1.3.1 but I'm pretty confident I can update all the way to 1.7 um, in the next series. But that will be after uh, episode 50 of this one. You'll see here, uh, yeah, we landed so close to the silicon production plant. We actually smashed one of the radiators, which was uh, a little unfortunate. But uh, we did need to land very close because this little module here doesn't have um, really any power production of its own. Since it's going to be linked into the nuclear reactor on this. I just wanted to keep the part count as low as possible and keep the weight down. Um, so it doesn't have any way of moving once we've placed it. So we really had to land as close as possible to make sure that we could connect these up. But uh, even though we lost one radiator, with all the added radiators on this module, uh, it more than compensates for it. So we've now solved all the overheating problems that we had with this. Uh, with all of its drills, the nuclear reactor and the ISRU, yeah, it was having some overheating problems. But now we've fixed that and we can activate all of the uh, smaller ISRUs on this one. I found out I can use the smaller ones. Uh, the big ISRUs have more functions, more capabilities than the smaller ones, so they can refine more different things. But they actually refine at exactly the same rate. So uh, when it comes to silicon, since they can both do that, uh, the big one is sort of like an all-in-one ISRU, whereas the smaller ones uh, are much more limited in their capabilities. But yeah, as I said, they refine at exactly the same rate. So uh, there is really no point in using the big ones since we're only using these to refine silicon. But now we're producing far more silicon than we're ever going to need. Uh, I think our silicon production uses about 0.4 uh, silicon a second, and we're now producing something like 1.6 a second. So we should build up a pretty big stockpile and we no longer have to worry about it. So we fixed our silicon production and now what we need to do is head on back to Artemis. So what we need to do now is uh, fix our chemical production which is um those are produced from minerals, so we need to add another module onto the uh, onto the base. So, as I said, we're going to make one big sort of all-in-one finishing module. It's going to have some agricultural stuff. Um, I might hire some farmers. That is a type of kerbal now, um, so we can actually reduce our supply consumption since we're going to have a lot of kerbals in this base. I'll probably add a few more hab modules so it can stay up here for a few more years. Maybe even a centrifuge. That might be a good idea. I'm not sure. Uh, a centrifuge on the surface of another world? Yeah, that could work, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, as long as it's at an angle, you can sort of counteract, well, you can have it at, at the right angle so that, uh, the, you know, the body's gravity and the gravity generated by the centrifuge, if you put the floor at the correct angle, you can have it so they're being pulled down to the ground at 1G. So, you know, that could work. We might try that. Uh, but yeah, something to try and, ex as you can see here, the glitch I was talking about is now hovering, but uh, just don't pay attention to that too much. <laughs> but yeah, as I said, so we'll try and make an all-in-one sort of module, so a few agricultural things um, to reduce our supply consumption, uh, and that final module to increase our chemical production, and then we can support a number of uh, engineers, and then we should have Artemis fully operational, and then we can start producing those massive solar arrays that we're then going to launch into orbit around Nemesis, create a beamed power network, Work, and then we can then use that to send a probe interstellar which will be the culmination of this series this whole series has been working towards this essentially uh, building the endurance which is going to be a plasma powered probe and then it's going to get its power from a beamed power network since we need to keep the weight of the probe down as low as possible we're going to use a really light probe core um, we need to use a pretty massive uh, communications array i got a new mod for that so you can actually con um, contact the probe over those extreme distances. But then the rest of the probe is just going to be fuel. And it's going to have a lot of asparagus staging. And it's going to try and keep the weight down as low as possible to keep our thrust to weight ratio as high as possible. Because uh, we need something like... 200,000 uh, meters per second of delta V to uh, to get a probe to Valentine within about 10 years. Uh, but I've done my calculations and I think we can build a probe with about 250 kilometers per second of delta V. So uh, yeah, but it does rely on having the power generation not on the probe. If you stick a giant heavy fusion reactor or something on it, then the thrust weight ratio drops and you get your delta V sent down to something like 50, um, which is not good. So it, a lot of my plans require a lot of infrastructure to be built in and around the uh, solitude system. 
But it's a good thing that uh, I find it a lot of fun to do this. Uh, and I think it's pretty cool. We've built this, you know, we've got an actual reason to build a, a base on the surface uh, of another world and set up all this cool infrastructure and build all these cool spacecraft. So, uh, yeah, we're not just doing any of this for the sake of it. This is the, the pretty fun thing of having a, an end goal and doing it in career mode is that we actually need to build all of this infrastructure and uh, get all this stuff in place before we can actually... Uh, do our mission, which I think is, is pretty interesting. So you'll see there we've uh, filled up the Asteria with a full load of exotic minerals and rare metals. Uh, it comes to something like, uh, something like 80 tons or something. It's, it's a pretty, pretty heavy load of stuff, but this has got uh, calculated it so this has got just enough Delta V to then get back with a full load of that. We almost fully refueled it. Um, it turns out I missed one of the fuel tanks and you'll have seen that we balanced the uh, <laughs> balanced the fuel tanks out because on one side I just missed one of the smaller fuel tanks but we still have more than enough fuel to get back. And uh, yeah, this is a lot less painful now. <laughs> We're not using those aero spikes. These two engines do actually have a, a slightly higher thrust to weight. Um, they are also more efficient in vacuum. They're not as efficient um, in atmosphere but I realized that this spacecraft really doesn't spend much time in atmosphere, so there's very little point optimizing it uh, for atmospheric flight. At first I was thinking maybe we'll use this spacecraft for everything, you know, like the SpaceX Starship, send it to the wasteland and all sorts, but uh, really I think it's, it's best just for these missions. Um, it's pretty much just perfect sort of design. And we can just keep reusing it um, for these missions to and from Nemesis to supply uh, Artemis. So yeah, I think that's what we're going to use it for. We'll design a whole lot of new stuff for the Wasteland. I think in the next series, even though the next series is going to be mainly focused on getting to Valentine, going into Stella, and then transporting. I think the end goal will be to transport like a couple of hundred Kerbals out there. I'll probably make like a custom contract with a you know a bunch of tourists, like a hundred tourists, and get them uh, get them out there. That could be pretty interesting. Uh, and make a self-sufficient colony in the other solar system. We're still going to be doing a bunch of stuff in this solar system. Of course, we need to finish our Reaper mission, and I think we will make some kind of base, not on the same scale as Artemis, but some kind of base um, on the surface of the wasteland, you know, back on uh, ruined old Kerbin. I think that could be quite interesting. Maybe a mobile base, actually, to you know, travel to all the different biomes, travel to the KSC, and get all the science from that, uh, so we don't have to go again. Because last time, we had a very limited uh, expedition to the surface of the wasteland. We landed, and we got some scientific reports, and we went back into orbit. Uh, but we didn't manage to land on Malice, because we ran out of fuel in the lander on ascent from the wasteland. Uh, and yeah, the mission didn't quite go as well as I'd have hoped. So I think if we design a spacecraft on a similar scale to Morningstar uh, and send a kind of mobile base to the surface of the wasteland, that could be really cool. Let me know what you guys think. Um, we'll do that at some point in the next series. But yeah, our next transfer window to the wasteland isn't for like a year and a half or something. So uh, yeah, that's not going to be until well into the next series. Uh, and I am hopefully, as I said, going to be able to update to 1.7. I've never jumped four versions <laughs> before and tried to keep a save file intact, but they've mostly been incremental steps besides the making history update. But uh, So it's going to be pretty big change, hence why I'm doing it at the beginning of next series, not halfway through this one since we're so close now. But uh, I think that could be uh, that could be pretty good if we do that. Anyway, you'll see here we uh, don't quite have enough parachutes to fully slow down, so we do actually hit the ocean pretty hard and lose our engines but thankfully we managed to save the rare metals and exotic minerals and that's what really matters we lost maybe 20,000 on the engines but we got over 4 million funds from those rare metals and exotic minerals from the surface of Nemesis so now we have enough funding in the next episode we shall be building our final module for Artemis and getting it fully operational before sending up the rest of our crew comprising of a number of engineers we'll probably send up a bunch of machinery we'll do probably another Asteria mission and land it and probably keep it there this time just in case they need to be evacuated at any point. But thank you for watching everyone. I've been the Bailey Penguin and I'll see you all next time.